Welcome to The Athlete's Record, where athletes share an honest and inspirational account of their sporting life, the things that matter most to them, and what they learned along the way. Subscribe now for more inspirational stories from the world's greatest athletes. In this episode, we meet Atto Bolden, the Trinidadian Sprint Superstar, four-time Olympic medalist and 200-meter world champion from 1997. Following his stellar career on the track, Bolden embarked on a career in the media as a commentator and analyst, and has also had success as a coach, having worked with Jamaican sprinter Brianna Williams, who was part of the gold medal winning 4x100m relay team at the Tokyo Olympics. This episode of The Athlete's Record is brought to you by Powerade. Developed with sports scientists, Powerade is a still, isotonic sports drink that helps support effective hydration and replenishes key electrolytes, energy and fluids that your body loses during exercise. I always say I grew up in Utopia because when you are born into a country where the leaders of the country look like you, um, you have you know this this great resource oil coming out of the ground, you have a fabulous education system, um, and then I grew up with you know very upper you know upper middle class. I look back now and I realize wow, at the time I didn't think I was as fortunate as I now realize I, I was. But you know, I, I had a you know trips to trips to, to the United States every every year on multiple occasions. I think my father probably purchased a computer when I was eight or nine years old. So I, I really look back on those trend, you know, trend ideas very, very fondly because you realize that you know everybody obviously comes from different circumstances, but I look back and I go, mine were mine were pretty ideal. I think when you grow up with Jamaica and Trinidad being part of your DNA and your um, and your parent, you know, parental lineage, I think that you, you know, you really get the best of both worlds because, uh, you know, as you said, the culture and the just quite frankly, the attitude that those are <laughs> those are two groups of people show me where they have migrated to and I will show you how well they are doing. Um and that's before we talk about, you know, like a, a Kamala Harris, which, you know, who is that's a little bit of a reach. I, I always feel like. But I can show you a lot of other people who um, are from those islands or their parents are from those islands. And they tend to be very, very driven when they uh, when they emigrate because they realize that, look, you know, we've we've uh, we've gotten a chance to, um, you know, to, to further ourselves in a big way. Um, my father is kind of a recluse. He could go two weeks without saying two words if it was up to him. Um, my mother is probably the exact opposite. Um, so I think as a result, it's created a very, um, <laughs> a very interesting situation with, with their children in particular me, because I have that side of me where it's like, you know, I could completely block out everybody and be fine. But I also have the side of me where if I have to be on television, hosting something, I can also flip that switch and 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 beyond. So yeah, I I have my parents have just about polar opposite personalities. But um, so my father's not a person with a ton of friends and a lot of people around him. But my mother is. So I, I really got to see kind of kind of both sides to what you know an adult uh, adult personality could be. The more research that we do into sprinters, um, the more we realize that whether or not the parents want to admit it the talent usually comes from the mother's side of the, um, of the lineage. Just, I mean, you can, you can watch it come down. So, um, yeah, I don't, and of course the whole Jamaica thing, um, the minute Jamaicans found out that my mother's from Jamaica, they were like, Oh, now it makes sense. Cause you know, nobody else from any other country could, could possibly, um, do anything. So uh, that's, that's always funny. When I was competing, Jamaica had one or two sprinters, but they're, sprinter du jour was Raymond Stewart, who by the time I come around in the mid nineties, he's kind of on his way out. Um, they also had a guy called Michael Green, who was, was my era, but wasn't as competitive. So it's, it's interesting that the mid I retired, I, you know, I ended my career in 04. That's around the rise of Asafa Powell. And of course, here comes Usain Bolt in 08 and Johan Blake not too long after. But when I was growing up, it was always the women. So my era, 
had Juliet Cuthbert and Merlene Adi and all the other, you know, and, and, and early towards the NBCB, Veronica Campbell Brown. But I didn't grow up in an era where the Jamaican men were sprinting particularly well. So it it was kind of a new thing. Everybody forgets that, you know, both is still the, the only Jamaican man that has um that has the Olympic gold in the hundred. So yeah, it, it it's interesting for me to look back because um Jamaica the Jamaican men were never particularly competitive in my era. True story, um one of my neighbors, Andre Walker, um back in Trinidad had come to my father at a very young, when I was very young, and said, your son has a, a real gift to, to sprint. And, um, you know, he looks like a world beater. That's the word. That's the, those were the words that he chose. Um, my father thought it was hilarious because I think in his mind, a sprinter had to look a certain way. And it was like, yeah, I was always undersized. I was undersized up until I was 16 or 17. Um, and I think my father sort of remarked, you know, <laughs> You know, maybe if he, you know, maybe if he puts on another, you know, 20, 30 pounds of muscle. But um, for, you know, he's he's he might have said that in 1980. Right. Let's assume I was six or seven at the time. Well, by 1997, I was Trinidad and Tobago's first track and field world champion. So that guy clearly saw something. But I think for me, it kind of clicked once I moved to New York. I actually encountered a, a friend of mine who he and I are, are still very close. His name is Adrian Bob. And back when the two of us were in high school in Trinidad, he was doing well and winning medals at the Caribbean Championships and so on. And that was always the benchmark. Now, this is the guy who developed early. He had like a beard in high school. So when I moved to New York and beat him in a race, I remember calling my mother and I was like, I beat Adrian Bob today. And she was like, what? So, yep, I did. Because we both knew that beating that guy meant something because he you know he had he had a decent resume at the time and that for me um so that would have been 19 um eight, 1990 in new york when i beat that and it was like a 55 meter dash but beating him i set up okay so there may be something here you know i got very sort of introspective um, and I started thinking about all the people that had poured into me and helped me and, and, and sort of, you know, assisted me along the way. Um, but it was all I, I don't have I don't have the fondest memories of the occasion because I was supposed to win the 100 as well. I was on fire in 1997 you know, just breezing through the rounds, but probably ran a little too fast in the quarterfinal. Not probably. Ran too fast in the quarterfinal. Uh, 9.87 at the time, the, the, the fastest qualifying round ever. Um, at the time when, you know, my personal best was 9.87. So it took a lot out of me, even though I was kind of, you know, uh, trying to just get through the rounds. Ran too fast in the quarterfinal. Was cramping. It was a very hot summer, as it is every summer in Athens. Was cramping by the final. And finished a, 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 a distant fifth. So when the 200 came around, which I was, um, I don't know if I was favorite to win because I was in there with Frankie Fredericks, who the, the year before had run faster than me. So I don't think I was the favorite necessarily, but he was not 100%. But I had been kind of fighting off the, the negativity from back home because they were like, what is it going to take for him to win something? Because, you know, we saw him not win last year twice. Um, even though it took two world records to beat him. And now that was a race he was supposed to win. He got fifth. So is he ever going to win? So the winning came almost as a relief. Like, oh, God, thank God I have the whole he can't win the big one off of his back as opposed to, yay, I won my, I, I won my country's first, um, first world title. And then they made it worse because the Federation had not brought a flag. So there is no, there's no picture of that victory lap in Athens with me with a flag. And that... And that is something which to this day bothers me because it's like, um, Federation, you had one job. I have never been on the top of an Olympic podium. <laughs> um, my, my first Olympic gold medal came kind of when uh, Brianna Williams won Olympic gold with uh, the Jamaican 4x1 this summer because I coach her. But I never stood on the top of an Olympic podium. So I can't, com I can't compare apples to apples. I can tell you that... The world championships are never going to be the Olympics. For a track and field athlete, for a swimmer, for a gymnast, you're always going to be measured by how you did at the Olympic Games. And those who don't have Olympic credentials don't get mentioned and, and some of them don't get remembered. Um, 
I think with um, with if if Worlds is a nine and the Olympics is a ten, so my my most treasured medal medal is a is is an Olympic medal. It's not a world. It's not a world championship medal. So it's that that's just that's just the way the sport is. That's if if you're an NF, if you're an American football player, you're going to be measured by your Super Bowls. That's just that's just the, the nature of the sport. Jerry Seinfeld has one of the most accurate comedy routines about silver medalists. Um, I suggest that that anybody who has not seen it just put in, just go to YouTube and put in Jerry Seinfeld um, Olympic medals, because what he so perfectly captures is the happiest person usually is not even the gold medalist. It's the bronze medalist because he or she is like, oh, my God, look at all the people that didn't get anything. At least I got something. And for a lot of bronze medalists, usually that bronze medal is their only medal and it's it's their only career medal. Um, I have three bronze and a silver. I can tell you the bronze you look back at, the bronzes you look back at and you go, wow, that, that's exactly how you feel. It could have been worse. The silver does create that, man, I was right there. So the silver makes you look ahead at what you didn't get. The bronze makes you look backwards at how how much worse it could have been. So um, yes, pr- bronze medals tend to be a little bit more prized um, for people who don't have gold than the silver, but the silver does um, create some other emotions because you go, man, second, really? That's, that's right there, <laughs> which, is, which is what makes the, uh, the Seinfeld routine so funny because he talks about that. He says, um, I, my favorite line in it is he, he, he does like a, like a side profile and he goes, greatest guy in the world, never heard of him, third, dead last. <laughs> but he only moves his head by about this much. So you get the sense of, yeah, the guy with the best lead is the greatest guy ever. And sorry, Mr. Guy who got fourth. We'll never talk about you again. Bolden in lane three. He's well up on Fredericks. John Drummond running well on the inside. And also Garcia still with the Greek coming up under Yotopoulos. But look at Bolden. Bolden is going clear of the field. Bolden is going to win by a big margin. Fredericks is uh, in second place. And Claudinei de Silva of Brazil just gets up to take the bronze medal. Well, a very clear victory indeed there for Atto Bolden. He may have disappointed in the 100, but he's come good in the 200 meters. A lot of ways, it's, it's probably the most important year in my career and my life. Because in 99, when I get injured and I miss the World Championships um, in Seville, I wanted to just, you know, be at home and, I don't know, drive my sports car or something and just feel sorry for myself. Because I knew Maurice was going to win because I was the only person I thought that had any chance of taking him down. Um, and my management at the time said, no, 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 no. You're going to come to Seville and we will find something for you to do. And I fought them tooth and nail. And uh, under under threat, I went to Seville like, OK, I'll come to Seville. And that's where my broadcast career started, because that's where I ended up, ended up on the BBC. Um, so I, I think for me, it there was a huge sw- switch that flipped in my head that summer because I said to myself, oh, wait a minute, this broadcasting thing is fun. You still get to obsess over track and field and, and be a and be a super fan. But, you know, it's 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 the best thing you can do if you can't run. And I think for me, I always had that in the back of my head. I was retired in five years and not a surprise that, you know, I almost immediately went into the broadcasting booth. Bar- Boris Becker is the first person I heard say that we were at a conference in uh, in Qatar and he said, and he said in front of a, a, a room full of very good retired athletes, Apollo Ono and everybody, you know, everybody in that room is an Olympic medalist many times over. He said, as an athlete, when it's over, the athlete in you has to die if the other side is going to emerge. And I think of like the athletes that I look at and look up to, somebody like a Magic Johnson. Magic Johnson is still, you know, is still is always going to be a basketball player that's what the world knows him for or at least that's what we knew him for initially but those days are 30 years in the those days are 30 years in the rearview mirror look at what he's done since so yeah these these are all things that i pay attention to absolutely my funeral was in athens in 2004 um 
I was not 100%. I was banged up. I had had that car accident in 2002. I was not the same. I knew I was not the same. I am, I am somebody who is very aware of what's going on, good body awareness. And I knew, it was like every time I get to top speed, something goes wrong. It's like having, I give the analogy, it's like having a, a, an exotic sports car. It's in a wreck. And they fix it. And you think, oh, it's fine. But every time you get it on the highway and you get it to 80 miles an hour, it starts to shimmy. And you go, oh, this is not the same car. That's exactly what happened to me. From the outside, you go, no, he's fine. He's, he's over the accident. But inside, there were things that never that never were, were, were fixed properly. And I was never the same sprinter. So um, for me, it was always about what are you going to do next? And for me, broadcasting was was kind of an easy fix and an easy transition because it's something that I had some experience doing now by the time I was done in, in 2004 and um, and really enjoyed it. For me, if I really enjoyed doing it, then it doesn't feel like work. After 9-11, I moved back to Trinidad. I just felt like, you know what, whatever is going on um, in the USA is, is is one thing, but I, I, just, I just felt a, a need to be back home. So I had moved back to my... Um, my residence in Trinidad. Um, I was actually going, talking to my father about looking after his health and saw a friend of mine who lives in his neighborhood walking home and decided to give them a ride home. So now I'm heading back for real and um, I'm just driving along and um, all of a sudden this car, which I think is gonna pass me on the right, makes a beeline for me and hits me. And we were going, I mean, we were going, maybe I was doing 50 the other miles an hour and the other car was doing 40. So, you know, when 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 those two cars um, impact each other, it's gonna be pretty severe. Um, I walked away from the crash. The, the, the driver who we subsequently found out was drunk um, actually lost his leg, um, his lower leg, I think. But, it was effectively the end of my career because I got out of the car and I am so paranoid about, you know, Trinidad hospitals and, and, and how awful our healthcare sector is that I was like, I'm not going to the hospital. I just basically went home. So whatever was wrong with me, it went untreated. I never treated it. So I, I don't think that helped. And uh, you know, if I if I had been in the States, um, I'd have probably gone to a hospital. I'd probably have gotten therapy every day for two months and I'd have probably healed better. We'll never know. I was in Trinidad and I decided I'm not not going to a hospital. So um, it wasn't, it wasn't probably wasn't the smartest idea at the time, but effectively my career ended when I, when that accident happened, because I was never the same sprinter. They say that the, the, the mental side is the last side to come back. And that's true, but it goes back to my analogy about the, the broken exotic car. Um, I did, you know, I eventually got back to the States and eventually got my body feeling like I could run again. But every time I really had to, to push it, whether in, in, and it wasn't really in practice, it was really just in, in competition. Every time I had to push it, something went wrong. Or I felt like something was about to go wrong. I, I, my hip flexor would, would be a problem or my hamstring or something. So it, it, be, it's, it started to become a real, a real uh, issue for me and an anchor in my brain because you could not compete freely because you always had that sort of looking over your, your, your own mental shoulder to, um, to worry if you were going to, um, you know, to have an injury again. It makes me laugh at myself because it's the one thing that I said I was definitely never going to do. Um, I didn't have the temperament for it. I didn't have the patience for it. I didn't have anything for it. I probably still don't. But yet here I am. Um, Brianna has done very well. Khalifa St. Fort did very well before her. I mean, shoot, she has an Olympic gold medal. She's 19 years old. I go, I spent my whole life trying to get that and you get that on your first try. Um, coaching life is making me gray, but it, it's such a rewarding thing. And, and I always heard that and I thought, I used to think, yeah, right. You know, you roll your eyes and stuff. It's like, oh, it's, it's so much better when you're doing it for somebody else. Like what? No, it's that, that doesn't make any sense. But it 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 is it is so. Um, I am I became a coach because I had two young ladies and and then other kids who had immense talent, and I thought the talent was not being used, it wasn't being developed. And next thing I looked around, and I was it's like, wait, hey, when did I? How did I get into this coaching room? And now I can't get out. But it really is very rewarding to see 
I mean, I, I told Brianna when she was 12 that she'd be in the Olympics in, in 2020. Now, I couldn't, I'm not Nostradamus, I didn't predict the, the pandemic, but she'd have had that gold medal at 18, not 19. I, 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 for, I saw that very clearly. Um, and when she started to run, I told her, I said, you are going to be leading off the Jamaican team in the Olympic Games just because of how well you started, how well you run the turn. And of course, you know, 13, 14 year old Brianna was like, you're right, because she's thinking that team is set. I'm just a little girl. And and here she is. So uh, I think coaching adds a lot more to my life than than I give to it. And that's that's why I continue to stay in it. Yes, it's hard. And yes, as you know, it's, it's stomach churning and all the emotions and, and the emotional investment and all that. But when Brianna won that that world junior um, world under 20 title three years ago, that's one of the high points of my life. When she wins that Olympic gold medal, that's one of the high points of my life watching this young lady, um, you know, accomplish her dream. So, yes, it is it is a difficult thing to do well coaching. But man, the rewards are amazing. You, yeah, and of course, I'm on the air for NBC. I have to call that race live. I, I, I'll give you a story that I haven't really told anybody else. Brianna has almost no relay experience. Brianna was training with me and not competing as a, a typical um, American high schooler would. So she ran very few relays. Um, she ran a couple with the Jamaican uh, junior team and never never with the pros. And, and quite frankly, if I had to rank her world-class relay experience, I'd say two, maybe a three. So when I looked up and she had made the team and I knew that she's 19 years old, I know Brianna is never going to be overwhelmed by the moment. That's not how she's wired. But my thing was, you know, there's things that could could happen in a relay I have to make sure she's prepared. She will tell you. We spent two full weeks working on, Brianna, what do you do if the person in front that you're handing off to leaves early, leaves before you hit that mark? And I know she must have been thinking, why is my coach so obsessive about stuff that I've never heard about? So she gets to the Olympic final where she's handing off to the now fastest woman alive, Elaine Thompson, hurrah, and Elaine leaves early. But because she's been taught it back here in Florida, it doesn't panic her. She calls a little early, which brings Elaine back to her. They make the baton exchange, albeit late in the zone, and Jamaica is safe. But in real time, when she goes around that turn, obviously I'm like, whoa, I mean, in my brain, I can't say it because I'm not supposed to be focused on one person. But you, I mean, you saw the leg. She, I mean, she blew everybody away. And then it comes time to hand off the baton and I go, uh-oh, because I'm not sure the baton pass has been made. I tell my producer, let me see another look at it. And in one look, I, I'm like, okay, good. It's not them. I saw the flag go up, but it's not for Jamaica. We're good. And, and you know, we get into the replays and, and I do my job and all that. But in that brief, what, 10 seconds before I saw the, the replay, man, I must have, I, I probably took several weeks off of my life because, you know, you, you don't want your athlete to be the one that's involved in in something that's uh, that's a mishap on that stage. And remember, that team was supposed to break the world record. They had they did not have good, particularly good baton exchanges. And that's why the world record still exists. I think they'll get it next year. But um, yeah, that was it, it was pretty impressive, you know, to see a 19 year old. Um, I mean, she held her own. That's that's and that's the best thing you can say for somebody that age, on, you know, in their first Olympic final. To staggers to unfurl. Watch where the passes happen to see who is in the lead. Jamaica out quickly. My goodness, like a bullet for Williams. A quartet for the ages. It's as simple as that. Brianna Williams. 19 years of age. Sport mimics life. So do not get too high for the highs and don't get too low for the lows. Um, the people who have the best lives are the ones who keep an even keel, I think. Um, and the ones who have the best careers um, are the ones who do the same as well. I think the part of the reason why I enjoyed my career so much is because, no, I, I was not on top of the podium uh, a lot. I have one 
won, you know, pro gold medal. Um, but I think because the journey was sort of almost more important than the destination, I didn't care. It was like, okay, so I got silver or I got bronze or that was a near miss. Okay, move on to the next thing. And I think we get so caught up in the final result or the world record or the, the, the ultimate thing. It's like, well, the ultimate thing is not going to happen for everybody. And if you, if you apply that to life, I see people who they're doing pretty well, but they're so busy looking across the fence. It's like, you have it so much better than all the other non-medalists, right, in the world. That you have a bronze, you have a silver, and you're looking over the fence to see, you know, what, what gold life must be like. And you're not appreciating the fact that you have a silver and that puts you in very elite company. Or you have a bronze and that puts you in very elite company. You want to talk about the Olympic Games? I have friends that went to the Olympic Games and their highest place finish is fourth. It's a completely different memory for them because they're traumatized by it. They're like, I was there. I went to the Olympics and I got, I mean, my friend Ian Morris from Trinidad, he was fourth in the Olympic Games in the 400 in Barcelona 1992. I was there. He ran 44-2. That would, that would damn near place in, in, in any Olympic since. But 44-21 was only good enough that day for fourth. And Samson Couture from Kenya outleaned him. So Ian has to spend the rest of his days thinking about, oh my gosh, I was right there. So for, for me, sport taught me the journey is way more important than the destination. One and two, keep an even keel, not too high, not too low. Anything bad can be overcome. Anything that's great, sure, enjoy it, but don't think it's always going to be like this. This episode of The Athlete's Record is brought to you by Powerade. Developed with sports scientists, Powerade is a still, isotonic sports drink that helps support effective hydration and replenishes key electrolytes, energy, and fluids that your body loses during exercise. The Athlete's Record is produced by Record Media. Subscribe now for more inspirational stories from the world's greatest athletes.